working group to really delve into this deeper. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm honored to talk a bit about this to all of you, um, patients, friends, family, and colleagues who have a true interest in cardiac sarcoid. So I want to really spend the next, I want to spend the next 20 minutes or so um, really looking at um, common questions that often will come up for both patients as well as providers when we think about cardiac sarcoid. Now, number one, how does cardiac sarcoid typically present? Um, what do we think of as clinicians? And as patients, what should you watch for when you worry about cardiac sarcoid? How do we diagnose cardiac sarcoid? So if we're suspicious that a patient has cardiac sarcoid, what type of testing can we do to really confirm the diagnosis? Once we know that you have cardiac sarcoid, the next question becomes how um, do we figure out when to treat the patient with medications or with a defibrillator. What a defibrillator is, it's really like a pacemaker, but in addition to pacing the heart, it can really jump the heart if the heart were to have arrhythmias. So I want to start by talking a little bit about how often sarcoid affects the heart. As Dr. Raghu mentioned earlier, in most patients with systemic sarcoid, the most common involved organ involved is related to lungs. So about 80 to 100% of patients will have lung involvement. What about the heart? If you look at all the literature, in this case, it's about a quarter of patients with systemic sarcoid will have heart involvement. And the difference for this is really there's a lot of variation if you look at this by race. Um, for a lot of organ systems, including the lung, it's fairly uniform. So regardless of what race you are, whether you're European, African American, or Japanese, the involvement is about the same. In the case of the heart, as you can see here, essentially, it's about a fifth of patients with either for European Americans and African Americans who have heart involvement. And in the case of Japanese, involvement can be as high as 80%. I find this really fascinating um, because as Dr. Gelk mentioned, I think that the ideology or the reason why patients get sarcoid isn't that clear. So I think this points that there's probably either a genetic predisposition or environmental factors might, that might drive patients to develop cardiac sarcoid or sarcoid in general. For a lot of these other organ systems, such as the liver, spleen, and the kidney, um, this is fairly uniform for groups. So I think heart is unique in that you see a lot of variability by ethnic group. So let's talk a little bit about how sarcoid affects the heart. So what exactly are we looking for, and what makes us worried? So this is a picture of a heart here. Um, essentially, this is the left ventricle. So this is a major pump that pumps blood to the rest of your body. This is the right ventricle, so this is the pump that pumps blood to your lungs. And what we often will see with sarcoid, as Dr. Wagu and Dr. Gofenray spoke about, is you get granulomas. So these are areas of inflammation. Typically, you get a lot of inflammation over time, as this progresses, the inflammation stops and will form a scar. So we often see this early on, this inflammation will really affect the septum. So this is the region between the two chambers of the heart. And when early on, when there's only a little bit of involvement, a lot of times there's really no clinical presentation. So many patients will actually have heart involvement, but not have any symptoms or signs that really can be identified. So this is actually very common. As this progresses, what we start to see is that this inflammation will spread, again, typically along the septum of the heart here. And what we know is that um, from the heart, typically the heart, you can think of it in simple terms as having various structures like a house. We have a structure or a foundation, which is a heart muscle, and this helps the heart contract. You have the electricity, which really helps the heart conduct. This simply goes from the top of the heart here to the bottom, and then it really depolarizes the ventricles, and that's what makes the ventricles contract. And we have the plumbing, which is the coronaries, the blood flow of the heart. So as you can imagine, if you get a lot of inflammation or scar along here, this is gonna affect the electricity of the heart rate conduction. And this is why patients, as they progress, will start to get conduction abnormalities, because they are not able to conduct the electricity normally down the septum of the heart. And what ends up happening is even though you have signal up here, this, because of the inflammation, you cannot conduct it down the heart. As this continues to progress, what will often happen is there's more and more inflammation. So in addition to affecting the septum, this starts to impact other parts of the heart. You start to develop scar. 
Sensations of conduction abnormalities will often happen with the scar is that what we see is the conduction will start to circle around the areas of scar and this will lead to arrhythmias. So many of you might hear, you know, one of the major concerns from a cardiology standpoint that some of our patients may develop what we call ventricular tachycardia. What this is, is essentially the arrhythmia will cycle around this area of scar so rapidly that the, this ventricle will conduct so fast that it can't pump blood effectively or lead to patients passing out. As this gets worse, you essentially start to get scar almost in almost all aspects of the heart, and this is where the structure is really involved. Because there's so much involvement, the heart muscle will stop to contract normally, and this is where we start to see um, basically muscle dysfunction, we call this LV dysfunction or left ventricular dysfunction, and this is where we see heart failure. So because the heart's unable to pump blood forward anymore, patients will often present with shortness of breath. So it's going to back up into the lungs. It can back up to the rest of the body, into the legs, into the stomach. And this is why patients get so symptomatic when they have heart involvement. So I think one of the take-home messages here is that you should really think about cardiac sarcoid if there's any evidence of conduction problems or arrhythmias. And this here is an example of what we call ventricular tachycardia. Again, the left chamber of the heart going so fast that you can't push blood effectively to rest the heart. As you can imagine, this is going to make you dizzy, make you pass out. And for patients who present to us with heart block or ventricular arrhythmias without any other cause, about a third of patients actually turns out if you look deeper will actually have cardiac sarcoid. So it's actually very common and oftentimes underdiagnosed. For all patients with heart failure, um, regardless of cause, what it turns out is for patients who progress on to requiring more support than just medications, for example, as the heart gets weaker and weaker, as a heart work cardiologist, we'll sometimes recommend a heart pump for the heart. It's called an LVAD. Basically, it's surgically implanted, helps pull blood out of the heart and push it to the rest of the body, or sometimes patients may need a heart transplant. So for all heart failure patients, it turns out that on the biopsy of the core, after when you do the surgery, or when you take the heart out at the time of heart transplant, about 3% of patients will have sarcoid where it's not recognized until they undergo surgery. So it's actually much more common than people realize and a lot of cardiologists in the community realize. So I think it's really important to really look for sarcoid for patients with arrhythmias who present with heart failure. So how do we screen for sarcoid? As Dr. Gelfman mentioned, I think one of the mainstays in good medicine is really getting a very good medical history. So we will, oftentimes we'll ask our patients, do you guys get palpitations? Do you feel your heart racing? Do you have episodes where when your heart races that you feel like passing or have you passed up in the past um, because of this? Do you have signs or symptoms of heart failure? Do you get short of breath when you walk? Do your legs get swollen? Does your stomach get swollen? I think that's really key. One other thing that we often will do is a 12 lead EKG for screening purposes. And this is very common. We basically stick leads on the chest wall and look at the electrical conduction. From a raise of hands, how many of you guys have gotten EKGs here? I know I have. Yeah, so it's one of the most common things we do in cardiology, and you know, for myself, I pass out. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know you have so cardiac sarcoid if you pass out. That's something to think about. So if the history of the EKG is positive, then we want to do a little bit more screening. Now we move on. We get an echocardiogram. So this is an ultrasound of the heart to look whether there's any abnormalities in the heart muscle and the walls or how the heart contracts. In addition to that we will often do a Holtz monitor, which is a bit of a more extended EKG. If these are positive, we move on and obtain more cardiac imaging, typically a cardiac MRI or a PET scan, which are going to be much more specific and sensitive when looking for heart involvement of sarcoid. In addition to that, this is when we think about referring our patients to our arrhythmia colleagues, because with cardiac sarcoid, one of the major concerns, again, is conduction disease or arrhythmias, in which case, they may need a pacemaker or a defibrillator. However, if the echo and the ultra are negative, um, then we recommend ongoing screening and follow-up. Um, essentially, you want to see a patient back once a year, see whether you know, any of these turn positive, in which case you want to do more screening at that time. So as I mentioned, you know, a lot of us have had EKG, so you're familiar with this, but essentially it's not painful, it's not invasive, we just stick leads across the chest wall, and this really gives you a snapshot of how electric conducts in the heart. 
As mentioned earlier, the nitrous signal from the top part of the heart that conducts down the bottom. So what, how this manifests on EKG is, this is essentially the um, conduction at the top part of the heart, and this will be at the bottom. So you really want to see an effective one-to-one -one ratio. We have a beak here in the essentially a cure S complex here. This is what normal conduction will look like. Unfortunately, if EKG is not that specific and or sensitive in terms of looking for sarcoid, only about 8 to 20 percent of patients with cardiac sarcoid will actually find something in EKG. And what we're really looking for is conduction abnormalities. So if you remember that this is a normal ECG, what we see here is this is abnormal. So for every beat on the top part of the heart, as you can see, you don't really have a beat on the bottom of the heart. So again, this is because of the infiltration of the granulomas, and the heart can conduct normally. And this is going to make you dizzy, might make you want to pass out. In addition, if you have a lot of fibrosis or scarring, what often happens is the electricity doesn't conduct normally. And because of this, it conducts slowly. So instead of this nice, narrow complex, this is now very broad. And that's what we look for on the ECG. Keep in mind that this is not sensitive, um, and will often, a lot of patients with cardiac involvement might not necessarily have this on an ECG. What about Holter monitor? So essentially, this is really an extended ECG. Um, we send you home with these leads on the chest wall, and this is connected to what looks like an iPhone. Nowadays, there are much smaller devices where we can just kind of stick this on a chest wall. It's nice, you can walk around. The idea is to have you go about your daily activities. We want you to exercise, we want you to go for a walk. So everything that you normally would do, just try to capture whether there's any evidence of conduction block or rhythm is during your regular activities. This is actually much more sensitive in terms of screening for abnormalities if you're worried about cardiac sarcoid. And about 40 or 50 percent of patients this is actually going to be positive for one of these abnormalities where there would be extra beats, where you have conduction abnormalities in the heart block or arrhythmias. Keep in mind that if you find this, it's not specific for sarcoid. What I mean by this is a lot of patients will have this, they might have other cardiac disease, but it's a very good place to start and a very good thing to do for screening. So again, what we look for are arrhythmias. This is another example of the ventricular tachycardia that I was talking about earlier, where your heart is going so fast that it's going to make you pass out. What about an echocardiogram? So this is also very common. It's not invasive. Basically, you have someone stick a probe and ultrasound on your chest wall, take pictures of the heart. So as an example of your um, heart here, this is going to be your left French and your right French um, The idea is you really want to look for abnormalities. Because if you create granulomas in parts of the heart, those parts are not going to function normally. And echo is about 25% sensitive in looking for abnormalities um, if you have cardiac sarcoid. So Essentially, if you have granuloma deposition, what that's going to result in is you're going to get abnormalities in that part of the heart muscle. So this is really what we look for. Um, if you can imagine, if you get inflammation, there's going to be a lot of swelling. It's like when you cut your hand, right? We all know that it gets swollen. It's the same thing with a heart. If you have granulomas there early on, you're going to get swollen. It's going to make your heart muscle thick. So that's one thing that we look for, is thickened heart muscle. In addition to that, as this progresses and your heart scars down, it's going to narrow. Um, and so we look for abnormalities like this where you get narrowing in parts of the heart and you get aneurysms ballooning out segments of the heart. And that's what we look for on the echocardiogram. And as this gets worse, the heart functions get drop. We look for abnormalities of the ejection fraction, how low well the heart squeezes. So normal, we say it's typically about 50 to 55%. And um, with sarcoid, we typically see drops in this ejection fraction depending on how bad the disease state is. So I think typically you want to screen with a good clinical history, if this is positive, then we want to get echo and holter. And if these are still positive, then we move on and get advanced imaging um, and additional testing to really confirm the diagnosis of sarcoid. So I ask, you know, since we have these screening tools, you know, they're great in terms of screening, but how do we really confirm the diagnosis? What criteria do we have? So there's two major criteria which have been developed to look for this. This is actually a heart rhythm slightly criteria, um, which you know, is based uh, from the oral arrhythmia colleagues in the United States. Many of you have also applied for a lot of Japanese Ministry of Health criteria. These two are actually really similar. To make the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid, you need to basically to follow one of these two pathways. So you can either biopsy the heart, take a piece of the heart tissue, and you will look for non cascading granulomas. If you have that on a heart biopsy, then we're sure that you have cardiac sarcoid. But this is very invasive. I mean, a lot of us you know, don't want to be stuck in the heart, for example, right? 
Um, so how do you make this diagnosis without sticking a heart? Although I do have to say, I'm not sure sticking a heart is any worse than sticking the eye or the spine, I guess. That depends how you look at it, right? Um, but essentially, if you, want, if you don't want to stick any needles anywhere, then you still want some type of tissue diagnosis you know, from the lungs, for example. In addition to that, you want one of these signs or symptoms um, that really confirm that you have heart involvement. So for this, we want to look for drops in heart function or conduction antibodies that respond to steroids. You might have arrhythmias, heart block. In addition, cardiac imaging here is very effective in terms of confirming a diagnosis. So I want to talk a little bit about heart biopsy. Again, you know, it sounds really scary. We actually do this a lot. Um, being one of our peer cardiologists, I work closely with heart transplant patients. Our patients actually get this and we, uh, almost weekly, early after transplant. It's actually not that bad. What we do is we make a small incision on the neck. We actually enter the internal jugular vein, so a large vein up here, thread a catheter all the way to the heart, and through that we stick what we call biotome, it's a thin tube, and we take very tiny samples from the septum, the area between the two sides of the heart. These specimens are only about typically one millimeter. So it's really tiny, it doesn't really cause long-term damage. So as an example of normal heart muscle, as you can see, you have nice cells, which are nice cell like without any gas between the heart muscle. Um, this was shown earlier, you've seen a lot of pictures of granulomas. So similar to any other organ system, we're really looking for these non-aziating granulomas in the heart. So an example of granuloma here with inflammatory cells, which are really between the nice heart muscle. So you, this is really abnormal, this is what we expect to see. Sorcoid. The problem is because sorcoid is so patchy, it's not going to be uniform. If you do random sampling, we we'll only get a positive biopsy about a quarter of the time. This is why we don't recommend doing a heart biopsy, even when we worry about cordyx sorcoid. At University of Washington, what we have moved on to doing, and a lot of patients really, is we do voltage try to biopsy. So what this is, is we have our arrhythmia colleagues stick a catheter into a heart and make a map of how the electricity works in the heart. If you recall, if there's granulomas, if there's inflammation or scar, you can, the electricity is going to be abnormal. So what this is, is in this map, they can really map out where the electricity is abnormal or normal. So in the red portions, this is really where the electrical conduction is abnormal. And what they can do is they can really put catheters against these areas that are abnormal. For example, here in this septum, this these little black dots. So, so what we do is we actually stick the catheter against these areas where the conduction is abnormal. We take specimens specific to these areas. So it gives us much higher diagnostic yield, and this is much better than doing random sampling. What about cardiac MRI? Um, this is analogous to brain MRI, um, but essentially what we do is we put it through a very large magnet. There's no radiation at all, um, but we know that that the human body is made of water and of atoms. What the large magnet does is it really aligns the atoms and creates resonant frequencies. And based on this, you can look for different portions um, of the heart muscle. You can look for scar, you can look for inflammation based on how the atoms align. Essentially, the more water there is, um, really, you know, the hydrogen atoms and protons in that area are going to align differently than areas with less water. And that's what we're really looking for. MRI is very good at looking for heart involvement. So, what we're looking for here is, this is heart muscle, this is a cross-section, it looks like a donut. So we look for late gadolinium enhancements. So typically, if in normal heart muscle, this would be all black. Um, if you have granuloma deposition there, what's happening is you have either inflammation or scar, so you have extra material around the heart cells. And what this does is it soaks up the gadolinium or the contrast agents, and it sticks there and makes us light up to so see these white patchy areas. And this is classic for sorcoid, where we see at the base of the heart, you get mid-wall um, gadolinium enhancements. And that's because this is representative of having granulomas in those areas. We can also do what's called a T2 weight inversion recovery. And what this is, it's a fancy term for really saying that in one of the sequences, we look to see whether there's water in the heart muscle. And here, um, corresponding to where we see the gadolinium enhancement, we see this light up. What this represents is that there's a lot of edema or water in those areas, again, representative of inflammation. So this is why cardiac MRI is such a good tool to look for heart involvement. I mentioned you could do PET scan. So what this is is positron emission tomography. Um, this is a nuclear radiology technique. So normally your heart muscle and other muscles, it uses a combination of fatty acid metabolism from protein as well as sugar metabolism from glucose. 
Um, so what we do is we have you eat a high protein diet, typically meats, eggs, and nuts for 24 to 72 hours before you go in for the study. What this does is it drives your body and your heart muscle to really only use fatty acids. So the idea is that your normal heart muscle will only uptake fatty acids, so only the inflammatory cells will use glucose. So you come in, after you're following this diet, we give you rubidium. That's a tracer to look at blood flow. So the base idea is you want to look for blood flow in the heart. And then we give you radial label glucose, and then inflammatory cells will uptake the glucose. So this is typically what it looks like. This is the normal heart on the top here. This is a nice horseshoe shape. Where if it lights up, it means the perfusion of blood flow in these regions are normal. And then we look, we'll look for inflammation, so it's the glucose portion. So here, as you can see, there's no uptake in the heart muscle. It's very bright, but this is all its background, it's all blood flow. So this would be what a normal heart looks like. In the case of sarcoid, early on, before you have scar, when you only have inflammation, the perfusion of blood flow is going to look normal. But you have areas here of inflammation, so you uptake glucose. As this progresses, what we start to see is your perfusion becomes abnormal. So here we have areas where you're missing the rubidium, and what this represents a scar. And corresponding to this, you have glucose uptake, so this is inflammation. So the beauty of PET is you can really follow how much inflammation there is. And as this progresses and gets worse, what ends up happening is you now only have scar. So here you have a perfusion defect, no blood flow, but no inflammation. So now the heart is only scar. Um, there's no more inflammation. So that's actually bad. So heart biopsy is really the gold standard, the best way to look for cardiac involvement, but it's invasive. Um, echo can be used, but it's not sensitive. Cardiac MRI and PET can help with the diagnosis, and um, PET is probably the best way to really follow treatment over time. So I, I think we're a bit over on time and keeping you from lunch, but so I'll go through this quickly. Um, but basically, you know, now that we confirmed the diagnosis, how do we treat? Um, we, you know, this was alluded to earlier by Dr. Ragu, oftentimes we'll want to treat steroids. So we don't want to treat all patients with steroids, because steroids have harmful side effects also. So the patients that we want to treat with steroids are typically if you have conduction disease, if, for example, a heart block, then you want to treat with steroids, it's very effective. If you have ventricular arrhythmias, steroids can be very effective. Well, about survival, so this was actually a systematic review where they looked at all the literature ever published in terms of cardiac sarcoid. They only found 10 studies actually looking at cardiac sarcoid in terms of treating with immunosuppression. And in these studies, none of them were randomized trials. What I mean by that is all these studies, they looked at patients who were treated and what happened. They, there was never a study where they randomized patients to steroids versus no steroids um, in terms of cardiac sarcoid. From a survival perspective, there's really, it's unclear, there's no data to net steroids and through survival. What about heart dysfunction? You know, we talked a lot about, for example, LV dysfunction, heart failure. So in the same systematic review where they looked at all the studies, there were four studies that looked at what happens if you treat LV dysfunction with steroids. So what they showed is if you have normal heart function, if you give a patient steroids, heart function stays preserved. If it's mildly reduced and you treat with steroids, it improves. But if the function is really bad and you give the patient steroids, there's really no benefit. And the belief is that if your function is this bad, you probably have lost SCAR. And SCAR isn't going to reverse itself, even if you treat with steroids. On the other hand, in a recent study from the Finnish group, they essentially looked at all patients in the country with sarcoid from 1980 to 2012. And these patients, even when the function was poor, um, there was still improvement. I think the take home message is if you have LV dysfunction, you should consider treating with steroids. So what dose do we use? We like to start about a half milligram per program per day, typically about 40 milligrams, and we treat for about three months. After three months, we'll get another PET scan to see if the inflammation has gone away. If it's gone away, then we take our steroids until you're off steroids, and we get another PET scan to see whether the inflammation comes back or whether it stays away. If after treating with steroids for three months, the inflammation is still there, then we want to add another agent. And some of these were discussed earlier, um, but the idea is we typically will add methotrexate. There's other agents we sometimes use. We sometimes consider using cell or mycophenolate, whereas a fat pinch. Keep in mind that the data for these other agents are actually not that good. Dr. Galvin mentioned for neurosarcoid, they like to use infliximab. For the heart, we don't use this, because there's actually data showing if you give infliximab to patients with heart failure, um, it makes the heart very much worse. So that's actually contraindicated if you have cardiac sarcoid. 
So what do we do after we treat with steroids? So let's say you know we have products where we get treated, the inflammation goes away. We want to get another PET scan about three months. If the disease comes back, then you want to start with suppression, typically with steroids and methotrexate, and get another PET scan again after three months of therapy. And most patients recommend lifelong therapy. If you're been treated, it goes away and it comes back at that point to make sure it doesn't come back again. If you get treated and you don't relapse, then it's, it's good, it stays remission long term. For these patients, we don't want to get zero PETs, even though the amount of radiation with PET scans is low, there is some radiation exposure. So for these patients, we recommend screening with ECHO and EKG about six months or every year, and we only recommend another PET scan if these become abnormal, where there's clinical evidence of sarcoid. So there's limited data in treating cardiac sarcoid with steroids. We do not have any prospective clinical trials, but in general, the consensus to treat patients with heart block PVCs, extra heartbeats, or ventricular arrhythmias, or patients with LV dysfunction. So what about deferred layers? I alluded to this earlier. When do we think about putting these devices in that really jumpstart the heart when you have arrhythmias? Since that's one of the biggest risks. As Dr. Raccoon mentioned earlier, one of the biggest concerns with sarcoid is you can have sudden cardiac death. So these deferred layers really prevent that. Um, and you know, if your heart were to stop, it will shock you. Um, basically, we start the heart. So these are great devices. But do we really want to give them to everyone? I mean, you don't, as a surgeon, you don't want to expose people to unnecessary risks. So the common criteria here is that if you have VT or a history of cardiac arrest or your ejection fraction is less than 35%, then you should get a percolator. This applies to any patient, regardless if you have cardiac sarcoid or any cardiac disease. So these are fairly uniform criteria. And in the case of cardiac sarcoid, we're a little bit more careful. So even if you don't meet this criteria, we look at other things. Um, if you have any indication for a pacemaker, for example, it's conduction abnormality, even if you don't meet any top criteria, then we still recommend getting a defibrillator to avoid a, another surgery in the future. You might as well do it at the same time. The surgery is very similar. It's just really just a different generator. In addition, if you have a history of passing out, or you're passing out, we recommend a defibrillator because this could indicate you have an arrhythmia. If we're unsure, then we would recommend doing an EP study where arrhythmia plugs take you to a lab, they stick a catheter in more to see if they can induce arrhythmias, and they can, then we recommend a defibrillator. Lastly, we have weaker criteria here, so criteria from strong, medium to weak. So now, if you have a little bit of LV dysfunction, but you don't need the criteria of EF less than 35%, then we recommend doing a cardiac MRI or an arrhythmia study, and if these are positive, then you can consider doing a defibrillator. So in summary, um, we have a lower threshold to recommend the fibrillator in patients with cardiac support compared to the general heart failure population. Cardiac imaging and arrhythmia states can be very helpful in risk strap by patients at the, identifying those at highest risk. So in summary, I want you to think of cardiac sarcoid if there is any evidence of conduction problems, arrhythmias, or heart failure. Um, to make a diagnosis, we recommend a heart biopsy, which is the gold standard. But if you don't want to do this, then we recommend, you know, really make a diagnosis with symptoms or with advanced cardiac imaging, such as MRI or PET scan. In terms of when do we treat, we recommend treating when there's conduction abnormalities, when there's arrhythmias, or when there's LV dysfunction or heart failure. And we recommend defibrillators if there's any evidence of ventricular arrhythmias or if there's any LV dysfunction. Um, so I want to end here with a nice picture of something human. Thank <laughs> you.